Hey guys, the Instant Camera Guy here. Uh, just an apology in advance that this video is a little more chaotic than my normal videos are. I had a lot of distractions while filming through things like dogs barking at mailmen to neighbors doing yard work and clients coming to pick up stuff for delivery. So there are a few more cuts than my normal videos would have. And ultimately at the end of the video, the camera didn't end up 100% functional. But that does mean that there are gonna be multiple parts to this video. And ultimately the client gave me permission to do something very, very cool to this. So you guys will have to stay tuned and find out what ultimately becomes of this camera. But I figured I would still edit together uh, a video because I talk about a lot of important information about the SLR 680. And I think you guys are gonna get a lot out of it anyway, even if you just stick it on in the background and listen to it. So I hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Instant Camera Guy, where today we will be unboxing, diagnosing, and hopefully repairing uh, what I believe is probably the most, well, actually, no, that's a lie. The second most overrated Polaroid camera in existence. Uh, you guys will see exactly what model I'm talking about in just a second. Of course, if you've already seen the thumbnail, then the surprise is ruined. Uh, but that is, of course, the Polaroid SLR 680. Now, the SLR 680 was released in the 1980s and effectively was an SX-70 sonar with built-in flash and the ability to take 600 format film natively as opposed to SX-70 film. Now, it is those features that make it the most overhyped <laughs> <laughs> instant camera that I know of um, and I'm going to show you guys through this uh, video just why I think that's the case so you'll see this camera listed all over the place uh, in lots of different videos uh, that will describe it as the best best Polaroid camera ever made. And note that I say best in inverted commas, because really, if someone ever describes a camera as, oh, well, that's the best model they made, you first of all have to ask yourself, what does that mean? How do you define best? Best as in best performance, best as in best looking, best as in most reliable, best as in the best build quality, what do you mean by best, right? But I think for all intents and purposes, the SLR 680 is often described as the best uh, because it's said to produce very sharp photos. Now, obviously it's got a flash built in, which is a big bonus for anyone that wants to say shoot at nighttime or in a scenario that's dark. Um, but the reason this camera is considered to take sharp photos is because of its ability to take 600 film. Um, so 600 film is 640 ISO, and SX-70 film is about 150, 160 ISO. So if you know anything about film sensitivity, you'll know that this camera basically takes film that is four times faster. And what that means is the electronics in this shutter Although the shutter is based on the SX-70, uh, the capacitor that controls the integration cycle in the electric eye, the capacitor is uh, about four times smaller. So in an SX-70 sonar, for example, the capacitor is roughly 1,000 picofarads. Here it's about 210. Now, that means that this shutter will fire four times faster. And what happens when you have a shutter that fires four times faster, the way that the SX-70 and SLR680 uh, shutters work is when the shutter is firing faster, it's actually giving you a smaller effective aperture for that given speed. So that means that let's say, for example, an SX-70 is firing with an effective aperture of say F11 for a certain scene. 
Well, this camera is gonna fire two stops faster, so f16, f22. So because that aperture is stopping down a lot more on the SLR 680, the images tend to have higher contrast and they tend to be a lot sharper because there's less uh, shallow depth of field. Now, the truth of the matter is, if you 600 convert a regular SX70, which I've been doing, I've been working on a whole bunch this week, these are all 600 converted, the lens on the 680, the lens on the SX70, like every single SLR model, even the Japanese made 690, the lens is exactly the same. Hold that thought, I think I'm getting a package. I'm gonna be right back because my dogs are barking their head off. Now, where was I? My apologies, German Shepherds don't like mailmen. <laughs> um, the lenses on all SLR Polaroid cameras are exactly the same. So the sharpness really has nothing to do with the optical design and it has everything to do with the, the type of aperture that's used. So the smaller the aperture, typically the sharper photos are gonna be on an instant camera like this. So really, if you have a 600 converted SX70, performance is gonna be the same as an SLR 680. Um, don't buy into the hype that these are somehow inherently sharper. They're not, it's just because of that native ability to take faster film. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of the SLR 680, this was produced during the 1980s. And uh, it was produced during a time where Polaroid was really cost reducing everything about their cameras. And these particular models really suffered the most of all SLR cameras. Now, just looking over this one, it's in pretty good shape, but it does have a lot of the usual standard SLR 680 problems. So the first thing is that this shutter housing for the sonar and the flash mechanism is made of a very brittle ABS plastic. You guys can probably see there's a little crack in the corner here. Uh, that is very typical of SLR 680 cameras. Um, basically any nudge is gonna chip the corners of these things. Now you can purchase new housings from uh, Retrospect and Polar Studios. So as of the time of this video, they actually make new housings because this is just such a problem. It is so common to get those little chips and nicks. And in fact, even opening this housing up, just taking this thing apart, you actually uh, stand quite a high risk of chipping the plastic because it's very, very brittle. The body is also made out of an ABS plastic, but it does seem to be a slightly different grade of plastic to the top housing. And generally the, the body is a lot stronger. In, in fact, it's about the same as an SX70 Alpha or an SX70 Sonar or an SX70 Model 2 that shares the same black plastic body. Uh, but the way that it's molded is a little bit different. And that means you've got to be very careful with the type of solvents that you use to remove the skin. And that of course brings me on to the next topic. Look at this disgusting skin. Um, Polaroid decided to do away with genuine leather by this point, and instead they released this really horrible kind of rubber vulcanite material that disintegrates over time. <sighs> Hold that thought. What do they say don't work with children or animals? Well, that time the dog was barking at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Um, but if this is proof that I try and do these videos in one single take, there you have it. Um, I will try and edit little parts out like that where I can, but on to the explanation. Um, so yeah, these cameras have a really terrible quality synthetic leather that basically just crumbles to dust over time. You can see where the black has turned into this white chalky mess. And basically every single one of these cameras will need to be reskinned uh, by this point. Um, apparently this camera used to belong to a guy called Rod, according to the sticker. Um, but yeah, so every single SLR 680 out there, you will commonly find chipped housings. You will commonly find poor quality leather that's crumbling into dust. So at a very bare minimum, they will need to be reskinned. 
Um, but there are deeper problems that are unique to the 680 as well. Um, for those that saw my last video where I overhauled and serviced a Polaroid SX70, that particular camera had a very loose mirror inside. So the mirror that was on the diagonal on the, the rear panel was very loose. Well, that is guaranteed to occur with every single SLR 680. Now you guys are gonna see this in a second when I open this thing up, but Polaroid swapped the grade of mirror silicon that they used to stick the, uh, to stick the mirror into these cameras. And in SX70 models and most SX70 sonars and alphas, they use a type of silicon that is silver colored. In the SLR680, they typically use a type of silicon that is like a clear color, kind of like what you'd use I don't know, to seal a window or something like that. Now, that silicon has a very poor adhesion to the glass. And what that means is that mirror, generally it'll fail on the two bottom panels first, and it's just gonna be loose in there, flopping around. Now, as I described in the SX70 video, what's gonna happen if that third blob of silicon at the top fails, that mirror falls down inside the body of the camera where when you then go to close it up, that mirror is gonna smash. And that smashed mirror, those shards of glass, will scratch up the Fresnel screen and will often puncture holes in the bellows. So it's very, very common for SLR 680s to have those issues. Uh, the other thing that commonly goes is the motor is held in place with rubber bushings that act as basically like a shock absorber to stop that motor from vibrating around. Um, around the Polaroid SLR 680, Polaroid swapped the grade of rubber that they used, so it was likely uh, cheaper. Uh, <laughs> someone's come home now so they can deal with the dogs. I can hear it outside. Um, so yeah, Polaroid swapped to a grade of rubber that was cheaper. And those rubber bushings effectively disintegrate over time and will need to be replaced. So I'm gonna need to make new ones. Um, and then the last problem that's common to SLR 680s is issues with the electronics. Now, by the time the 680 was released, to be honest, the electronics were pretty reliable in terms of the microprocessors. Polaroid had had uh, a, a good 10 years or so minimum to really perfect all of the integrated circuits. So Texas Instruments, who were making the boards on these, uh, were generally doing a good job in terms of the chips. So very rarely will you find a 680 where the chips fail. But around this time, Polaroid swapped manufacturing of the PCBs to Taiwan. And Taiwan these days is known as basically like the world headquarters of chip manufacturing and electronics manufacturing. They are incredibly skilled. It is basically their entire com um, economy. But whoever did the factory back in the day for these often really skimped out on the solder. Um, dry joints are very, very common in SLR 680s, and we may find some of those today. If, they, if it still works, it's gonna work, but they can just spontaneously go bad. So every Polaroid SLR 680 that I come across, that I service, will need to have its PCB completely resolded. Now, for some reason, as I was saying before, the SLR 680 is really hyped. And as a result, prices for these things have been steadily climbing for the last few years. When I started out, repairing these, you could pick up an SLR 680 for about 150 Australian dollars, which is like 100 US dollars, which would just be an absolute bargain these days. Um, it is not uncommon for these cameras to sell unrestored, like in this condition, for 500 US dollars. And I had a client of mine pay 800 Australian dollars recently just to get one in completely original condition, so not refurbished at all. Now, I believe the reason that the SLR 680 is as hyped up as it is, is because of those features I spoke about before, namely the electronic flash and the ability to take 600 film natively. Now, the built-in flash is obviously handy, but I'm gonna show you guys something. Here is the shutter from an SX-70 sonar. Uh, they are basically the same, in fact, the PCB is completely identical. You can put this PCB into this camera. The only difference is the little capacitor that sits down here has a different value. The shutter blade design in a 680 is ever so slightly different, but 
for the user, that doesn't actually mean anything. Basically, the electronics are the same. The only difference is the housing, and instead of having a flash socket, there's a flash that's built in. But what happens when you buy a mint flash bar? Well, <laughs> you basically gain all the functionality of a Polaroid SLR 680 uh, at a fraction of the cost. Now, to be fair, the 680 does have a trick up its sleeve, which is that it's very good for macro flash because the flash actually tilts, if you guys can see that, depending on what you're focusing on. So if you focus down to 10 inches, which is the minimum distance, that flash is actually gonna tilt downwards and better illuminate your subject, where the mint flash won't do that. But I mean, unless you're really taking a lot of macro flash photos, my recommendation, honestly, if you are looking for a good Polaroid camera, buy yourself an SX70 Sonar instead and have a technician like myself, feel free to send it to me, have someone overhaul that SX70 Sonar, convert it to 600 film, because by the time you buy an SX70 Sonar and a mint flash bar and pay to have it refurbished, you're probably still looking at less of a total cost than picking up an SLR 680. It's just wild how expensive these have become. Now, does that mean this is inherently a bad camera? Well, no, it's quite a good camera, but I do feel like it's really overhyped, um, especially given just how lousy the build quality is on these things. The other, the other disadvantage that I'll talk about is the shutter mechanism because of the flash and the, the sonar all being built in, it's really long. And that makes the camera itself really, really long. So I'm just gonna grab an SX-70 here and we can compare. Like look at the difference in the length, right? It adds all this extra bulk. And that extra bulk and weight actually puts a lot of strain on the poor metal lens board that holds everything on to the front. And what you'll actually find is these things get really warped over time. So one of the first things I can actually notice is this doesn't close nicely. I don't know if it's gonna pick up easily on the camera, uh, but this side is sitting far too high comparative to the other side. And that's because the weight of that extra shutter has just bent that part forwards over time. So I'm just gonna press down and bend it back. It's really as easy as that. Now it's sitting flush. Um, but yeah, these are good cameras, don't get me wrong. But are they necessarily, like is it necessarily worth paying all that extra money just to have a built-in flash with a little tilting mechanism in case you wanna take a flash photo of something 10 inches away? Well, I'm utterly unconvinced. <laughs> but. If you absolutely must have all those features built in, well, this is the camera for you. But just bear in mind, any camera, any, uh, any Polaroid SLR, such as this SX-70 Model 1 that I've converted to take 600 speed film. If I can get the camera to focus, hello. Got a little sticker here saying that it uses 600 film. Um, these will perform identically. So, don't read into all the hype because there's about a hundred videos on YouTube talking about the SLR 680 saying it's the best Polaroid ever. Um, well, no, that's not necessarily true. In fact, these things have a plethora of design flaws, which leads me on to my main final point. These absolutely have to be refurbished. Um, one of the reasons these are so popular is because people think that you can grab one of these off the shelf and have an SLR that shoots 600 film. They're seen as desirable because the camera doesn't need to be modified to take 600 film. So people think, hey, great, I can buy one of these. Uh, you know, I'll just reskin it myself. I'll save a bit of money. Um, not true. These more than anything need to be overhauled because of that mirror issue. It is just such a critical problem on these particular SLR cameras. So on that topic, uh, let us dive in and start to take this thing apart and get a good look at what's going on inside. Um, I haven't tested this thing yet. I do have a few empty packs of film. Hopefully this has enough power to test the camera. 
Okay, that one is running out of juice quite clearly, so let's try another. Well, it doesn't do anything either. Uh, it looks like the 600 battery packs that I have are starting to run out of their, their power. Either that or this camera's got issues. <laughs> Um, and that's the other thing with the SLR680, the electronics need quite a lot of power to work. So, if the batteries in the pack are not super duper fresh, uh, it's just not going to turn on. So, I'm going to try and find a pack of film that has a bit more power, and I'll be right back. Uh, if not, what I can do is simply just take off that bottom leather panel, and then we can use my external battery back to power this thing instead, just to test its functionality. So I'll be right back. Well, I tried a few empty Polaroid packs. Um, nothing worked. So I'm pulling out an old uh, little device that I made. This has uh, some AAA battery holders in it, uh, as well as four 1.5 volt lithium batteries. And we'll see if this powers the camera instead, since it's got no signs of life. And uh, yeah, we're getting some power because the, uh, the shutter blades are closing. Can you guys see that? But the motor is not turning. So um, as I said before, this is fresh lithium batteries. So there's no way that it's the pack of film. My other packs of film likely work just fine. This camera probably has issues. So uh, let us then dive in and uh, see what's going on. I'm going to assume that the motor is likely seized, and by the time we refurbish that, the rest of the camera will work just fine. Now, one of the things I have to talk about first of all is the camera skin, because to get inside this thing, we have to remove that skin, and being that it's made of synthetic leatherette, there's no way that we can salvage this particular uh, covering. It's going to crumble into a million pieces. There's just no way of saving it. Um, at a very minimum, we need to take that bottom panel off, but this entire camera does need to be reskinned. Now, what I like to do in terms of this, there are a few guides online that will tell you to take a chisel and, uh, and remove the skin that way. Please don't do that. It is a terrible, terrible way of de-skinning your SLR 680. Um, if you want to bleed, then this is going to be the best way to do it, because what's going to happen, this leather is quite soft, and it's the adhesive that's on it is very powerful. So you're going to be pushing, 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 it's going to give way, you will slip, you will stick yourself with the chisel, and you will bleed. I guarantee it. If you go on Retrospect's uh, Instagram, they've got a few old reels that they had doing that. And like, you can see the person using the chisel is wearing like this Kevlar welding glove in the other hand, because you are just so guaranteed to slip. It is so dangerous. Do not use a chisel to remove this soft leatherette. You can use a chisel when you do like NSX70 Model 1, and underneath the leather, you've got the crusty adhesive that's still there. And when you would do the Model 1, very, very small movements so that you don't stick yourself. But at the SLR 680, SX70 Model 2, these synthetic leather Polaroids, do not use a chisel. Because the other thing that a chisel is going to do, it's going to take big gouges out of the plastic. And you can tell when you purchase uh, a camera that's been reskinned, you can tell that an amateur has done it. Because when you look along the side seams of the body panels, there'll be all these pock marks where someone's taken a chisel to it. So how do you de-skin it then? Well, I'm gonna show you. A heat gun, right? Um, now, if you don't have a heat gun, use a hairdryer, right? Anything that is gonna get hot enough to soften the adhesive. So, I'm gonna show you guys. So, Basically, what you're going to do here is uh, just soften all the adhesive 
You'll know that you've got it hot enough when that white chalky color starts to change color. So see how it's gone and starts to turn black? And the reason for that is the, uh, the powdery layer on the top is starting to melt and turn back to its original color. Now you might think, oh, if I do that, I can recondition the skin and make it look new again. Well, of course you could, but it's just going to come back. But this is it. This is all it takes to de-skin one of these. Now I quite like my little portable heat gun here. Um, it's very convenient because there's no cables, but before this I, I used to just use my wife's old hair dryer. She got a new hair dryer and replaced her old one and uh, that served me well for about eight years. And then basically we just have to pick off the old skin. Now, what I like to do is just using a screwdriver, see if I can actually lift up the adhesive base. And I like to have a little competition with myself each time I do this and see, can I peel off that leather piece in one go? But this is it, I see so many videos of people de-skinning cameras and they're taking chisels to it. It's like, what are you doing? Just use heat, you crazy person. Ah, oh, we were so close. But that's all right, the, um, the leather had a big crack along that seam, so that was bound to happen. Quite often these will crack like a dry riverbed. And that's it. All you need to do. Now, look how messy my bench is because of all this uh, crumbling leatherette. Uh, I'm just gonna sweep away some of this mess. Now, one of the things that this leatherette leaves behind is a sticky adhesive and Polaroid used this kind of adhesive on their Spectra cameras and on the SLR 680s. And you guys can see the remains. Now, fortunately, this adhesive is not lumpy like on the SX-70s, which tend to, to lift up and leave lumpy marks. Uh, this sticky adhesive is very, very flat. And so really it's gonna be up to you as to whether you wanna then remove that adhesive. I'm gonna argue and say that you shouldn't. Reason why, the only thing that truly removes this adhesive that I've found, and I've tested a lot of products, is citrus oil. So, uh, which is like a solvent made from um, like oranges, basically. Now citrus oil, in addition to being something that you do not wanna huff for long periods of time because it will absolutely mess you up, um, citrus oil does have the unwanted side effect of discoloring the plastic on the ABS. So as I was saying earlier in the video, Polaroid used a different grade of plastic for the, SX, uh, for the SLR680. And what you may find is the outer surface of that plastic becomes discolored when you use citrus oil. Now you can use shellite, however shellite doesn't dissolve it very well and you're gonna find yourself buffing for a long period of time and it may not come off at all. Alcohol doesn't work. Acetone will work, but it'll also have the added benefit of uh, removing the body panel as well because it's gonna eat straight into that ABS plastic. So what I generally recommend that you do when it comes to reskinning an SLR 680 is get yourself a cloth, Put on a bit of shellite, so uh, in other words, naphtha or lighter fluid. And what I would do is just, just remove like the big chunks of like skin that gets stuck to the adhesive, just so that that adhesive is flat. 
and that's it. And then what I would do, honestly, I would put the new leather panel straight over the top. Now, every other type of SLR Polaroid, I would l remove all of the gunk that's there. But as I said, and I'll stress this again, in an SLR 680, that adhesive is flat. You're never gonna be able to tell it's there. And in my opinion, the risk of discoloring the body panel or melting something uh, is just not worth having that surface completely flat. And I say this as someone that's been doing this a long time. I've, I've done this for 13 years. It's just not worth the risk because I've got to work on clients' cameras and the last thing that I want to be telling them is, oh, by the way, I've discolored and now you have these tiger stripes along your, you know, camera that you paid 800 Australian dollars for. The other thing that you really have to be wary of if you're using any kind of um, solvent to remove that adhesive is this sticker with the, the brand information and how to use the flash. Uh, they changed design of the sticker from the standard SX-70 cameras and basically any solvent will completely wipe away the black. So this is actually a white sticker with black ink on it and the lettering that you're seeing, the lettering you're seeing is actually a negative, right? So you're actually seeing the white plastic underneath. Most of these stickers are a white, white sticker with black ink and the text is a negative. So when you go to use your cloth and you accidentally hit that part because you're buffing away trying to get the adhesive off, you're gonna ruin that sticker and need a replacement. So, like I said, this is really the only model of camera where I just, I, I would not recommend it. Um, in terms of the discoloring of the plastic panels, it really just depends. I've had some where absolutely nothing's happened and the body panels have been fine. I've had others that have absolutely just, it looks like striping when you go to, when you go to clean the adhesive off. So these days, I just don't bother. I would recommend that you also don't bother. So what I will probably do and what I typically do for SLR 680s, I will actually de-skin all the body panels first and I will re-skin the door, the top viewfinder panels and that rear panel before I do anything else. Um, which seems like a bit of a roundabout way of doing things. Usually I would completely de-skin a camera first. I would just leave it de-skinned and skin it at the end. But the SLR 680, I do things the other way around just because of that adhesive. Uh, and as I said, you know, feel free if you wanna uh, ignore my advice and uh, try and buff this adhesive off, by all means, go and knock yourself out. Uh, caveat emptor. You will very likely discolor a panel, and if you do, well, don't say, I didn't warn you. Um, but yeah, so that's that's basically all I wanted to say on the subject of uh, de-skinning. Um, what I will do now is basically just do the rest. I'm gonna take the door panel off, do this, and through the magic of editing, everything is gonna look very, very clean. Um, I do apologize about all the noise in the background today. It is very busy at this household. There's a lot of goings on. There's a lot of people coming and going. I've got clients uh, picking up cameras that I've sold them. So it's really all happening here today. So I do apologize if this video has more cuts than it normally would. But uh, yeah, through the magic of editing, the next time you see this, uh, it'll likely have new leather panels all over it. Well, that looks a little bit different, does it? I've gone ahead and reskinned all of the body panels that are not necessary for opening up the camera. And as I said, the reason for that is that sticky adhesive will basically just get in the way. It's going to attract dust and things like that. So I find that it's much better to just reskin the camera at this stage and then work on the rest. Now, on the subject of the leather, I always use Aki Asahi leather imported from Japan. Um, he is a camera leather manufacturer. He does leather for a whole range of different cameras, but his SX-70 leather in particular, I am a huge fan of. I've tried numerous suppliers over the years, and in my opinion, Aki has the most consistent, good quality leather that there is. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Hugo Studio. I'm not a huge fan 
of retro spec skins. I'm not a huge fan of some of the other synthetic leathers that you can get. And I always try and reskin my cameras in genuine leather. Reason for that is genuine leather is very hard wearing. It is a natural product and it wears very nicely. Petroleum based vinyls and other synthetic skins will only have a shelf life of probably five to ten years before they start to disintegrate. It's just not a very good choice. So for future proofing, I like to use genuine leather. Now, if you happen to want a, a plant-based alternative or a vegan alternative to using natural leather, I would recommend either a metallic finish, so you can get like aluminium panels made up in the same shape, or I would recommend wood grain. And Aki Asahi actually does a really good cherry wood skin for these cameras as well. So uh, if you're not into animal products, uh, I do recommend either using wood or metal to reskin the cameras. I would not recommend using synthetic products because it'll just crumble into dust and uh, yeah, being petroleum based, they're not amazing for the environment. So now that all of that is done, I am gonna open this up. Now, SLR 680s use proprietary screws. Uh, they use a square screwdriver bit and I have some custom made bits that attach to my screwdrivers so that I can easily take them out. Uh, and. Polaroid started to use these square screwdriver bits uh, pretty much starting with the SX70 Alpha, continuing into the Sonar, and then finally into the SLR 680. Uh, what prompted them to do this change? I'll never know. <laughs> um, but it certainly makes them that little bit more annoying to take apart. Um, just on the subject of the leather as well, when choosing a black leather, I always prefer the Aki Asahi crinkle emboss finish. Um, over my 13 years repairing cameras, I find this to be the absolute creme de la creme of leathers. It's incredibly hard wearing. It gives the camera a really beautiful finish. It's amazing to touch. Like it's a real sensory experience. Um, but most importantly, if you need to remove one of those leather panels and stick it down in the future, because the leather has that crinkle finish, it stands up really well to wearing and deformities. So basically that means that, you know, if it gets crinkled or scuffed, it's really hard to tell. So I really like it for that reason. So. I'm just gonna wipe a bit of that penetrating oil off that I used to get those four screws out. It's not always necessary, but I like to get into the habit of doing that because it does just make removing those screws that little bit easier. All right, we'll pop the bottom panel off and now we can start to take a look at the insides. Now, the little rubber bushings on the motor as expected have started to disintegrate. Um, so I will probably make new motor bushings out of some heat shrink. I'll show you guys uh, how to do that in just a second. And then I'm going to uh, take the side cover off. Um, I also feel like I should emphasize at this stage in the repair video that this is an advanced repair. Uh, it is not something you necessarily want to be trying at home. The little card is going to come out again. Unless you are very proficient at electronic and mechanical repair, this is not something I would just pick up willy-nilly trying to save a few dollars DIYing it yourself. Unless you are happy to brick the camera, uh, I would recommend sending it to an expert such as myself that's going to be able to do it properly. Um, so with that warning out of the way, let us disassemble the rest. So I'm just taking out all the screws for the main shutter housing and I really just want to get that shutter off the camera so that I can then focus on the body. Uh, I do want to test the body on its own without the shutter being on there just to make sure that that motor is spinning as it should. Uh, I have my soldering iron turned on. Now as you guys could see from the start of the video for some reason, this camera didn't want to receive power to the motor. The solenoid was closing in the shutter, but the motor did not power up. 
Now, that could be because the motor is simply seized. Uh, it could be, yeah, could be for lots of reasons, really. Um, but that's really the first thing I want to do is get that motor working and make sure that that's all operating as it should. As I said in my SX70 repair video, the motor is really the beating heart of the camera. If the motor is not working, the rest of the camera can't function because it doesn't even get to the stage where it can cycle any of the other components. Um, now, the SLR680 also has one of those metallic tongues inside. Um, these metallic tongues are not held in place with rivets. They're held in place with metal stakes that are pressed onto the camera body from the factory. So they, they can't really be drilled out. Uh, I find just lifting it up with a screwdriver uh, is the best option. And then what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to file down those little stakes on the inside of the camera, uh, because otherwise they will get in the way. Those little stakes will actually uh, scratch up the base of your packs of film, and they'll leave little shavings of plastic everywhere, which is not ideal. But a little hobby file will make short work of those stakes. Now the reason for removing that tongue, as I've said a few times uh, on my previous live streams on Facebook, and I believe I went through it on the SX-70 video, but those little metal tongues prevent you from inserting what Polaroid would deem as, like, the wrong pack of film. Um, so, for example, on iType film, uh, so that people don't get confused and accidentally insert it into their camera and wonder why it doesn't work, uh, they actually will put this, like, plastic lug in the center of the rear of the pack, right about here, and it prevents you from inserting iType film. Well, given that this is a 600 native camera, someone in the future may want to battery convert this to external batteries so that they can use iType film. And if I remove that tongue, well, it's one less thing that they have to worry about. All right, so I filed down those little lugs. Uh, now we can take apart the rest of the camera. Uh, but first, let's have a look at that motor. So. Uh, Certainly these um, rubber bushings are starting to disintegrate. They're actually intact, but they've started to turn like wet, like they're turning into liquid. So I am going to put those off to the side. I'll be making new ones. Um, and I like to make new ones using heat shrink. Of course, you can plastic 3D print them if you want to. Um, as a general rule, I'm not a huge fan of 3D printing. Um, it requires quite expensive setups. Low-end 3D printers produce pretty poor quality components. Um, and I don't like having to wait for print times or anything like that. So uh, we're going to take the motor apart and refurbish it as we normally would, as I showed in the last video. Now, SLR680s do have what they refer to as alpha spec motors, so it's the same kind of motor that you would find in an SX70 Sonar or an SX70 Alpha. Um, they are a slightly different design and have a slightly different grade of carbon brushes. So typically, they are more reliable, they are less prone to failure than the earlier models, but it's, it can still happen. So. I'm going to do my due diligence and just refurbish it anyway to ensure that it's working as good as possible. Now, one of the things I actually wanted to cover in my very first video that I uploaded where I did a AAA battery conversion of a Polaroid One Step SX70, I had someone leave a comment and say, Oh, you know, it was, it was nice to see you burning your desk with your soldering iron, because I was soldering just directly on this wood here. Um, and I don't know if that was like a serious comment or they were just being funny. Um, don't worry, this isn't a desk. This is a piece of wood that I've put on top of my desk. Um, because the reason being, this wood will protect the desk. Because as a repairman, I'm constantly using hammers and soldering irons and things like that. I don't want to have to worry about the surface of my desk all the time, so I've put down this nice big piece of wood, 
And over the course of these videos, the more that I'll do, the more dirty this piece of wood's gonna become, the more used it's gonna become. The more it's gonna have chips and nicks and, and dents and that kind of stuff because, well, that's what happens to a workbench when you use it. So if you're seeing me spraying stuff on the bench and using my soldering iron on there, it's because this is literally a piece of expendable wood that I put there for that very reason. So that I don't have to worry about my bench. It sits right on top of my desk, so I just wanted to clear that up. Just in case you think I'm a crazy person and that I do my soldering on bare surfaces. Um, of course, another alternative is like I could get one of those little uh, claw stands where it like holds, uh, you know, holds the wires together. Honestly, those are such a pain in the bum to set up. I would just rather do it on the surface. Um, but I do have like a little mini vise that I can put things in if the soldering job is really, really fiddly. Uh, but honestly, most of the time I just simply don't bother. So yeah, who knows, maybe in like a year of doing these videos, my bench will look completely pockmarked and, and uh, even worse than it currently is now. Now, alpha spec motors can be very difficult to get back together. This one is particularly tight, my goodness. Whoop. No, let's try again. Model 1 motors are much easier to take apart and put back together again. These, this particular one, just the clasps are so strong. I'm gonna get a little screwdriver here just to poke in that little plastic clip. My goodness, there we go. Wow, that has high tolerances. <laughs> My goodness. Alrighty. Now, one of the things you actually might be noticing as well, the ribbon cables that make up the electronics on an SX70 uh, Alpha, Sonar, and SLR680, and sometimes the Model 2, it's made of a different material. It's like a waxed paper with the copper traces running within it. Um, this was actually one thing that was a big improvement over the earlier material that Polar had used, which tends to delaminate. Um, despite being made of like, what is effectively paper, um, it's incredibly durable. And I much prefer it to earlier models. All right. Now, the bushings that were on this camera are made of rubber and they are a proprietary shape. I'm going to replace them with a bit of heat shrink. I tend to find two layers of appropriately cut heat shrink. It does a good job of mimicking the original thickness. And heat shrink is a good, alter a good alternative to the original rubber bushings because heat shrink is sort of made out of a rubber material. So it has that flexibility. Uh, it's also nice and cheap, can be cut to really any size that I desire, uh, but most importantly, because it shrinks, it sort of molds to the shape that I need it. So I like to use it. Uh, I do know other technicians sometimes use 3D printed um, motor bushings that are made of plastic. Uh, I've never used that because I find that this is effective enough. I mean, really anything that's just gonna widen the supports on that motor is going to do the job um, but i do like the fact that heat shrink is a pretty similar uh i guess what's the word i'm looking for squishiness compared to the original rubber so it's a it's a good choice and we'll just trim it down And hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm basically just putting the two layers, one on top of each other. And then I'm gonna shrink them down. And look, technically I probably didn't need to do this bit because the other bushings, 
the other bushes were still holding up, they were still intact, but like I said, they'd started to turn into like a liquid. So they were on their way out and they were gonna crumble. A lot of times when you open up a 680, uh, there's no bushings even left, they've just completely turned into dust. And that was already starting to happen here. All right, nearly there. Great. Now on the Alphas and 680s and SX70 sonars, they did change the length of the drive shaft uh, coupler where it attaches to the spring. And that actually makes getting back, getting the spring back on a lot more difficult. So I'm just gonna put the light right here so that I can see what I'm doing. Um, depending on how well the camera wants to cooperate, it can be quite a difficult job, but that actually went on very easily. I'm happy with that. So yeah, that's in all the way. And then while I'm here, I'm just gonna get my syringe of synthetic oil and lubricate the brass collar where the drive shaft goes through. And then what I'm gonna do with the motor off the camera, I'm going to force start the motor. Basically by dumping six volt straight into the motor circuitry, which is a good way of testing whether or not a body functions uh, if you're not sure whether the shutter has a problem or if the body has a problem. If you're not exactly sure what's going on, this is a good way of doing it. So, pack of film, door closed, one, two, three, four and five, pins four and five we need to bridge. So we'll just use anything metal for this. So that works fine. I'm happy with that. So I will just grease the pick arm, get some of my lithium grease from the other day. It is making that little satisfying click, but could be better. There we go. All right, now we can start to take apart the rest of the camera, access that internal Fresnel assembly, clean all the optical pathway, and most importantly, glue down that mirror because it is 100% guaranteed to be loose unless someone's already gotten in there and done it for me, which is pretty rare. You just never see it. And this one, considering it, it had its original skin, um, I doubt that it's been done. So, I'm just taking apart a few little hinge pins. Gee, this one's really stuck in there, isn't it? There we go. That was really tight. Now, I mentioned in the SX-70 video that on later models, such as the 680, these two little parts that hold the uh, bellows onto the lens board are no longer screws, but they are rivets. Uh, again, this is just yet another example of Polaroid's wonderful cost reduction that they started to do on some of these later models. So earlier cameras tend to have design flaws due to um, you know, sort of unforeseen issues in the design. And so Polaroid ironed out a lot of those bugs and then decided to use cheap materials and add a whole bunch of new issues. So uh, yeah, the alleged best Polaroid has a whole bunch of things that'll need to be looked at in order for it to work properly. 
All right. So we've got it down to this stage. Uh, I just need to take out the two screws that hold the bellows in. And then we can undo the clips and get inside the mirror box. Now, unfortunately, you kind of just have to fold the bellows over onto the camera. Get out of there. Um, you have to, yeah, you have to fold the bellows, sort of like flip it over um, in order for everything to sort of sit right. Um, probably what I'll do just before I do that, just to make my life a little bit easier, I'm just gonna clean some of the, the outer, outer aspect of the bellows. Um, so I'm just getting a bit of glass cleaner. Glass cleaner is a really good product, by the way. It cleans like everything. It's really soft. It's really gentle. It has a very low risk of doing damage. And it's actually really great for cleaning the rubber. Like, I am sure I could be sponsored by Windex at this stage, the amount of this stuff I go through. It's really great for cleaning, like, just about everything on cameras. Uh, but yeah, just one of the things that Polaroid did, again, with the 680, they cost reduced the rubber material that the bellows are made out of because, well, because of course they did. And uh, it tends to get sort of powdery when exposed uh, to the elements and sort of forms this yellow powdery layer on the bellows. Fortunately, it does just clean straight off, but it is something to be aware of. So, uh, on that note as well, the black little erection arm here that holds the camera in position, uh, this is a different length to those used on regular SX-70. So if you ever break this arm, you need another 680 arm to replace it. The reason that it's a different length is Polaroid, because of they, because they added so much bulk to the housing, uh, on a regular body, when you pull it into the erect position, it rarely actually engages the little sliding arm. You've kind of got to manually push it forwards just to ensure that it clicks in. Um, so they actually made this arm a little bit shorter and they changed the design slightly of, of the, where the arm links to, uh, to compensate for that. So an SLR 680 body is actually easier to open than a standard SX-70 in terms of the erection arm. So just a little fun fact for you. All right, now I'm gonna get my special little pokey tool and we're gonna give the camera a good poke in the right spot to open the bellows. There you go, that's one side. And just do the other side. Sorry if my head's getting in the way. There we go, very carefully. Now we can separate those two. And wow, what do we know? A loose mirror that's just completely flopping around. How did I know that was going to be the case, guys? Could it be that the SLR 680 is basically garbage <laughs> in terms of the materials that it's made out of, yet somehow is described as Polaroid's best camera? You guys see what I'm getting at now? Every time I see someone on a forum describe this thing as the best, I'm like, yeah, well, you wait till you have to take one apart and fix the damn thing. So flimsy. Uh, anyway, I'm just going to cut that little plastic lug so that we can swivel the mirror around to the side. Um, so often these things, oh my god, it just literally came off. These things are so dodgy. See what I mean about that silver, uh, the silver silicon being replaced by clear silicon? It's just like, it's the least, they might as well have just got this mirror, licked it and just put it in there, seriously. Just woeful. Uh, so what I'm doing, I'm just removing as much of this silicon as I can. I'm not going to worry about getting all of it off. There's no need. Uh, the new silicon will stick to the old silicon really well. Um, and also, I'm going to be using silicon on the center as well, not just the three corners. So let's grab out my favorite product. The Permatex Black Adhesive Silicon. I've nearly got to open up a new one of these. I'm really down to the last remains. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to clean 
the inside of this bellows, again with that cloth and the glass cleaner. Reason being is a lot of dust gets up and in there, and if you don't take it off the bellows, that dust is going to find its way onto the Fresnel screen eventually. So it's nice to just clean the camera up while you've got it in the open position like this. Now the bellows on this one are actually in pretty good nick, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. There's very little of that yellow uh, powdery effect going on, so these are these are possibly made with um, the better quality bellows. Maybe they had some SX-70 sonar bellows lying around in the factory when they did this. Um, but these ones are actually yeah, pretty decent. So now I'm going to grab some alcohol and a cloth and I'm just going to prep the surface for the new silicon. Just to sort of get rid of any impurities that may cause an issue in terms of it sticking. Let's see if I can get any of this silicon out too. I mean it's pretty tight in there, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that ain't going anywhere. Cool. There we go. Uh, don't worry if you scratch up this area underneath where the mirror goes because honestly that's just going to help the mirror stick better if it's got a bit of a scuffed surface instead of being super smooth. And again, just prepping it all with alcohol. And then we need to come and clean this. Um, you can actually see the remainders of the sticker that used to be on here that says, warning, remove sticker before you uh, glue it down. So I will again just get some glass cleaner on that and clean the surface of the mirror before we apply the new silicon. And then we've got to obviously leave this to dry and we'll need to come back to that tomorrow. While it sets. Because it really is a, a 24 hour cure time with that silicon. I mean, truthfully, you could put it together sooner uh, but it's just not a very good idea in case it shifts. You really want it to be secure and in position first. Uh, I'm going to use a bit of alcohol on this mirror too since it's having a hard time becoming clean. There we go. Now there are two surfaces to this mirror. Cameras will all, uh, always reflect off of what they call the front surface. So that's the side that has the silvered layer. Uh, the other side is basically glass. Now if you accidentally stick this mirror in upside down, uh, what you risk doing uh, is, is basically getting this sort of um, ghosting effect happening where you're going to get a reflection both off of the glass as well as off of the uh, mirrored surface itself too. So again, I'm just making sure that this is as clean as we can get it. I can notice that the battery is getting low on my little camera that I'm recording with, so fingers crossed I make it, guys. I think I should. All right. And 
little more for good luck, just in the center there. All right, I'm actually gonna, it's probably a little too much there, so let's just spread that around. There we go. Now that is the appropriate amount of silicon uh, on which to hold the mirror in. So I'm just gonna press that, uh, that mirror in right now. Just getting a bit of uh, silicon that I just spilled on my hands there off before I do that. And uh, yeah, then we basically just leave this to dry. So yeah, it's really just a matter of using those plastic lugs as a guide, making sure it's in there straight. Pressing nice and firmly, but not so firmly that you smash it. And uh, yeah, playing the waiting game. So I'm going to go set this to dry in my cupboard. And uh, I'm going to hit pause on the camera. And we're going to come back and take a look at the shutter. So while the silicon on the mirror dries, we will pay attention to the shutter instead. Now this shutter unit is not something that I've been able to test as of yet because the body of the camera wouldn't power up. Uh, potentially that's because the motor was seized. Uh, either that or there's some kind of issue with the body of the camera getting power. So before I reassemble this thing, I will need to make sure that all switch assemblies are clean, free of any oxidization, so that electricity can flow through all wires and terminals as good as possibly can. Uh, but what I will do in the meantime is just clean up the shutter housing a bit. Um, I've given it a bit of a wipe to get some of the dust off. Um, effectively what I'll be doing is really just opening it up, having a look, see if, if I can see anything broken. Uh, I will be resoldering all the main connections on the rear of the PCB and cleaning the electric eye to ensure that it exposes as, as good as possible. Um, and the only real thing that I can't test when I've got this open is whether or not the autofocus mechanism works. The way that the autofocus mechanism works on one of these, in a nutshell, is it basically sends out a wave of high frequency sound uh, through this sonar transducer. That sound bounces off an object, hits the transducer again, and uh, effectively a little analog computer tells the lens to start turning, and it actually counts little pulses of infrared light that are uh, pulsed through use of a gear with slots on it. It acts like a rotary encoder, just like you would find in the in a an old ball mouse, like back in the day for your computer. And uh, once it counts enough pulses of light, it stops the motor, engages uh, a little pole to stop the gear from turning, and that's what actually gives you your focus distance. Now, if that little opto sensor has died, uh, usually it's because the little LED in the sensor has burnt out, it will need to be replaced. Um, but if you don't see me doing that in this video, it's because this one was fine. Now, on the subject of opto sensors dying, what happens when they die is the camera will focus to four and a half feet every single time. So you'll go to hit the focusing and it'll, it's always going to focus to just over a meter every single time. The reason that it does that is uh, Polaroid engineered the circuit in this uh, to basically focus to the hyperfocal point. So that is the point in which the most things are going to be in focus. Um, it, should that mechanism ever fail. fail. So it, it basically if it fails, it becomes sort of like a fixed focus camera uh, designed to be optimally sharp from sort of four or five feet to infinity. Um, but that's why that happens. Um, like I said, I haven't been able to test this. Um, if the mechanism works, there's no need to touch it. There's no need to preemptively replace that LED or anything like that. Uh, LEDs pretty much last forever. Uh, they have a really high operating life and that LED only shines for a split second while it counts those pulses. So the main reason that they fail, I believe, is because of defective LEDs rather than, say, constant use. So once, like, if you get one and it works, it's likely going to stay working pretty much for the life of the camera. Uh, if you have one that's dead, 
it's likely because it was a factory cheap poor quality LED that simply burnt out. Um, I've never actually seen an SLR 680 that's been working like fail. Uh, they've only ever arrived to me failed. So uh, I do really believe it's sort of like a survival bias. If it works, it's likely going to keep working. Um, so let's just get straight ahead and open this thing up. Now to access the front housing, you have to slide off the logo. And then we have access to a long square headed screw, which I will take out. Uh, this is the only screw on the SLR 680 that is like unique in terms of uh, size. So make sure you don't lose that screw. It's very hard to find a replacement that fits. Then we just want to undo two little clips on the side of the shutter. Now, as I said before, it is very easy to break the little plastic clips. Oftentimes they're already broken. So for example, this clip that holds that side on is just missing. It likely broke off years and years and years ago uh, because it certainly hasn't fallen out of the camera and that side was simply just loose. But there are little clips at the bottom of the housing that should hold it on. Fortunately, if they do break, it's not the end of the world. Um, that screw holds on the panel well enough so that those clips aren't really necessary. So don't worry too much. This brings us to the inside of the camera and the flash mechanism. Um, this flash has not been powered up, so it's totally safe to handle um, because the camera never really got power in the first place and the flash was always in the off position. But just in case, let's get the old uh, flash shorting, uh, the flash capacitor machine but yeah, there's, there's no charge in that capacitor, so it is safe to touch. Uh, but still, better be safe than sorry. Once the top panel is off, I can now access the rest of the camera. And unlike the early model SX-70s, which have that anti-static layer that I had to remove with acetone, the blades on an SLR 680 are generally very, very good. And these are in perfect shape. There's really no need to go in and clean that and do anything here. Uh, furthermore, the lens all spins really, really well. So all I'm really gonna do to this shutter for the time being is, is just clean the front of that lens um, because the rest of the glass here is in just mint condition. Um, there's really no de debris, nothing inside the lens. It's very, very clean. A lot of times you'll find a lot of dust on the insides of these housings. Uh, and again, this one, incredibly clean. I would say it has lived in that box its entire life. Um, but yeah, there's not even any dust on the um, light dark wheel. The flash cam looks good. So I'm really just gonna focus on cleaning that electric eye uh, and resoldering all aspects of the PCB where it attaches to ribbon cables. Now, one of the things I'd like to point out here is this PCB is not shielded from the factory, which is a bit of a no-no. Um, you really should shield the parts on the back where the capacitor is, just in case that solder ever bridges with the metal lens board. Um, it'll throw off the way that the uh, automatic exposure system works. So uh, on these plastic body cameras, um, if you guys watched my Model 1 teardown, you would have realized that all the base was made out of aluminium. On the 680, really from the Model 2 onwards, uh, they swapped out all that aluminium panel with plastic. Uh, but furthermore, on the Alpha, Sonar, and 680, the entire lens is made of plastic. So it no longer has a metal housing, it is plastic on plastic. And fortunately, this is in really good shape. There's no haze or anything like that, because if there was, I would need to cut out that rear lens cell in order to clean it, which is very irritating. Fortunately, I don't have to here. Uh, there is no connection other than that little plastic lug on the left-hand side of a 680 PCB. So they are relatively easy to peel back. Now there is a little bit of corrosion on that electric eye, but it honestly looks really clean. So this is an example of a 680, which is in pretty good condition. This is really a case of preemptive maintenance and a little bit of servicing uh, in order to keep it as good a condition as possible. 
especially with that mirror, that's the main important thing that we're doing. Uh, luckily, the rest of the camera is in pretty good nick. Now, the reason that I brought up the fact that that capacitor is unshielded is that this PCB originally was very likely intended for an SX70 sonar. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the SLR680 is basically just an SX70 sonar that has been uh, given the addition of an electronic flash and had its capacitor swapped out. This PCB is completely identical to one that you would find in an SX70 sonar, like this here. Um, in fact, provided that you swap the capacitor as well, you could actually put this PCB into the 680 and it's gonna work fine. They have the same connections for the flash, the same connections for the ribbon. Uh, on the subject of the ribbon cable, another thing that you'll notice, the wires that connect the shutter to the body of the camera on a Model 1 are different to these later versions, such as the Sonar and the Alpha. They basically swapped from using uh, seven individual like wires pressed into a ribbon cable uh, to this capped on like flex cable design. And in the factory repair bulletins, uh, Polaroid mentions that the reason that they did this is apparently these wires were supposed to be stronger and more durable. Uh, to which I say nonsense. <laughs> um, durable in what way? Maybe more durable to heat, but certainly not more durable to tearing. Um, it is not uncommon to find one of the traces has ripped because of that flexing over and over again over time. Uh, or the other reason that these cables uh, can rip is someone's taken the shutter off and like let it dangle off the body of the camera, like, like let it hang by the cable and it tears the cable. Um, if you have a look on Mint's YouTube video of them clean and SX-70 sonar, the guy just has like the body of the camera in one hand and the shutter is just dangling by the cable. Um, really bad idea. On a Model 1, yep, you can do that because the wire is really strong. On a Model 2, that's the greatest way to destroy this cable. It's very, very easy to do. So these cables are kind of fragile. They can withstand flexing a lot. They are very, very, very strong. So normal operation, they won't break. But if you mishandle them when you're repairing them, they absolutely can break a trace. So uh, as I said before, this is complex repair. Be aware that if you do something wrong, you can brick your camera. So what I'm going to do is basically add some flux to the sonar cable that goes to the flash unit, as well as the power cable just on the side. And I'm just going to add some extra solder to this. Uh, now technically, if you test it and it works just fine, then you likely don't need to do this step. but because I know for a fact how poor quality some of these SLR680 PCBs were soldered from the factory, I just do it anyway, because you can never have too much solder. So it's just, it's just good habit to sort of reflow all main joints. Uh, the capacitor I do not need to. Um, one of the joints that I will reflow is on the electric eye. Now, on the SLR680, these traces get covered by a layer of insulating material. So you just got to strip that off. Now, I know this may not seem necessary, but I have seen enough cameras in my time that fail on that top connection to the electric eye. Uh, I don't know why, they just do. So again, I'm just in the habit of, while I'm here, just preemptively resoldering it, as easy as that, to ensure that it's gonna work. All right. Uh, there's yard work going on outside, by the way. If uh, you're wondering what the the noise is, it's just a leaf blower. I think this is like the most noisy video that I've done. So many distractions from doorbells going to German shepherds barking at mailmen to having to uh, uh, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To having to, oh yeah, re in the mirror and pause for that while I put stuff away. This is like the most interrupted <laughs> recording I've done so far. That is just beautiful. I'm gonna bring this a little bit closer to the camera here. Maybe I'll illuminate this with a bit more light. But yeah, basically what I've done is just re-solder every single one of those points where the ribbon cables meet the body. Uh, and I've re-soldered all the shutter button connections and solenoid connections as well. Now, like I said, the reason that I did that, these things are very prone to having dry joints from the factory. Um, even if they look like they're connected, oxidization can get underneath those ribbon cables and just reduce the flow of electricity by adding resistance. So it's just a good idea to redo that part. And this is one reason why, you know, for example, like in guitar amps and stuff like that, you pay more when the boards are hand soldered. And it's just simply that a human being will put more solder on than a machine can. A machine's going to use the bare minimum in order to get by. Uh, a human can't do that, so you're actually going to get quite a stronger solder joint if you do it by hand than if I was relying on a machine. So, uh, sorry AI, but you're not coming for my soldering job just yet. Uh, now, what am I doing here? Right, next thing I need to do is actually insulate those ribbons that I just soldered. Reason being is that now that those ribbons are hand soldered, the solder is a little bit thicker and it can, it can, it doesn't always, but it can bridge on the back of that shutter housing, uh, on the back of the lens board, which is made of metal. And if that happens, it can cause all kinds of funny gremlins, just depending on which traces get connected. So I like to just insulate everything. Uh, insulation also prevents oxidization. Here we go. And I'll insulate the ribbon cable attachment as well. And I will insulate where the factory forgot to insulate the capacitor. Now, the tape that I'm using here is called Capton tape. It is specifically designed for PCB and electrical work. Uh, it can withstand very high temperatures, so it's very good for soldering uh, because it will naturally protect whatever components are on the board. So for example, like if I was soldering a lot of traces and I wanted to protect a chip, I could put some tape over that chip uh, capped on tape is cheap to buy. It's not particularly expensive stuff. And I just, I really recommend it if you're gonna do electronics repairs because it's gonna make you appear much more professional if someone opens up your repair job and sees that you've used the right tape than, uh, you know, just using tape. And like I said, it's, it's really not that expensive. So yeah, I like to just, you know, go a little overboard, really make sure that it's insulated. Uh, because this capped on tape is easy to remove if I ever wanted to peel it off. And where I've put all those tapes, uh, pieces of tape, I should say, um, they will all come off as one piece if I try to lift it. just on the bottom of the solenoid. That's it. But yeah, just a little insurance policy. Um, 
as I said before, not a hundred percent necessary, but I have had them bridge before. So I like to just make sure that everything is as insulated as possible. And uh, yeah, that pretty much covers it for what I can actually test at the moment on the shutter. Everything is very, very clean. Normally what I would do, like if I was feeling resistance in any of these gears, if I was seeing a lot of dust under the light dark wheel, if I was seeing a lot of haze or dust underneath this lens, I would take apart slowly some of this shutter and, and get inside and clean stuff. I'm really not having to for this particular camera. It's really just a matter of checking things. Now, in a, f in a few days, I will start work on another 680, which is absolutely destroyed. And I will go into more detail on how to take the uh, actual flash housing and stuff apart in that video. But for this particular camera, I mean, it's likely lived in its original box since it was brand new. So there's really no need to dive further into it. So what's left now is to wait for tomorrow for that silicon to cure and resume where we left off. All right, it is the next day. Mirror silicon has dried. So really it's time to reassemble this thing and just clean it as we go. Uh, one of the things I did off camera, I realized when I rebuilt the motor that I forgot to put the little plastic washers in it that are located at the end of the rotor in the DC motor. Um, now what those washers do, I honestly don't really know. I have experimented with removing them, certainly in the first generation of SX-70 motors, uh, of which I have some here. Uh, these don't have any washers in them, and dimension-wise the rotor and stator and brushes are all exactly the same. Why they decided to add little washers to the alpha spec motors, I have no idea. In the past, I've experimented with putting them together without those washers. They work just fine. But I did realize that they were sitting there on my bench. So I put them back and reassembled the motor. Uh, so in case you guys were watching with eagle eyes, uh, yes, it was something that I picked up. And uh, I'm gonna blame the dogs for being distracting. But it's one of those things, if you notice at the end of your day of work that you have parts lying on your bench, you're gonna to need to figure out where they came from. Uh, but that was very easy to rectify. So I just wanted to add that I did that off camera. Um, basically what we're gonna do now, cause this mirror is completely secure, uh, I'm gonna clean it and make sure that there's no dust or anything like that Uh, this is a lot more annoying to do on an SLR 680 because the lens board has to be attached to the bellows. So you kind of just got to flip it over like this and hold it. Uh, on the Model 1s, I, I really do prefer to just separate it, but I do not want to be drilling out rivets and re-riveting when I do not have to. It's a very uh, annoying prospect. So you kind of just got to hold it together like so. All right. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is just flip the mirror up very gently and just clean some of the dust off the bottom. The mirror surface that I'm cleaning here is the taking mirror. And the taking mirror is what's responsible for uh, light basically bouncing from the lens off this mirror and onto your film. So if there are specks of dust and fungus like was on here, uh, it will show up in your image as like black spots. Now, eventually dust will get back into this mirror assembly. It, it is after all an open design. So you don't really need to worry, I guess, so much about it being perfect. Although I tell you what, this mirror is a little scratchy. Hmm. I am going to need to film test that and see if it's going to be an issue. Because it doesn't look amazing.
Okay. Just gonna reset the mirror. There we go. And uh, yeah, so on the on the taking mirror, there's actually some very fine little scratches. Um, sometimes that happens when people are uh, inserting packs of film incorrectly. Other times it just seems to happen like from the factory. Um, there are numerous things that could cause that. They do look very faint. Uh, I am just gonna reassemble this camera and then test it. But if that proves to be an, an issue on the final image, uh, I will need to replace this internal Fresnel carrier. So I'm certainly not gonna put that bottom leather panel on until I've absolutely finished with this thing. Um, what I will do though, is do a rule of thirds grid. A rule of thirds grid really helps in terms of composition. And this is a technique that I came up with. I based this off of old press photographer techniques who would use a pencil to draw on the ground glass. And what this does, I've got a ruler here that just so happens to be the exact width of one third of the Fresnel assembly. So, by uh, drawing the lines on pencil in the Fresnel, we add a set of grids. And those grids are very handy in terms of composing because the way that the SX-70 viewfinder is set up, your eye kind of automatically gets drawn to the bottom one third of the image. And having the grid in there really helps. Like I've done this to my own personal cameras and I like it a lot. Now I'm using a nice sharp pencil here uh, because that is the best substance that I've found in which to mark the Fresnel screen. Um, I've tried other methods. So I tried using a scribe to like carve into the Fresnel screen, the little rule of thirds grid. Um, that did not work at all. That completely warped the Fresnel near where the scribe was. Um, I, I experimented with that on a really scratched up Fresnel that was going in the bin anyway. Uh, and yeah, just not a good idea. Didn't work nicely. Um, I have also tried things like fine markers. I've tried Sharpies. I've tried all kinds of stuff. But the problem with anything using ink or paint is it runs along those microscopic uh, rings that make up the Fresnel screen. So pencil I find is really the best solution. Um, but yeah, now we have an SLR 680 that has a rule of thirds grid added to it. So I'm gonna keep on assembling this, uh, mainly because I wanna show you guys how it's done. Um, and I'm also gonna clean the inside of this viewfinder. Just polishing up the little switch here because I'm very curious to see if this camera will power on at all. But yeah, the, uh, that faint little damage on the mirror is really interesting. And I hope that it doesn't cause any issues. Otherwise, I won't be able to finish this repair, or at least I won't be able to consider it finished until that's rectified. Um, but yeah, if that is the case, then we may need to use some uh, spare parts. This particular client of mine has actually sent me several cameras, uh, but the SLR 680 is the one that he really wants the most. Um, so it's entirely possible that I may need to sacrifice one of his other cameras in order to get this thing working if that mirror is really damaged. Um, but yeah, I mean, this cloth is completely soft. There's absolutely no way that could have caused the damage. 
And certainly, there's, it doesn't look like there's any way like inserting a pack of film could have caused the damage. But it's only really noticeable in very specific angles. Like looking at it from this angle, I can't even see the marks. So I, the truth is, I don't think that they will appear on the film. Um, I'm really just nitpicking here um, because I've got very high standards. And I like to ensure that, you know, if the camera does have an issue that I can't rectify, well, at least the client has to know about it. Uh, but it is, of course, fixable with a new um, a new mirror. But we're going to need parts for that, and that'll obviously increase the cost of repair. Uh, getting new mirrors cut is a possibility. Uh, there are lots of optical companies out there that make new front surface mirrors, but they're very expensive to have cut by hand, uh, especially in small batches. Um, to the point where it's almost just worth getting a spare parts camera and salvaging it for some of the other bits and pieces too. You know, uh, I think the last time that I had it priced up, a new mirror was something like 50 British pounds, which is like $100. And for $100, I'm well on my way to, you know, scoring a, a scrapped SX-70 that's, you know, seen better days, that will probably have a decent replacement mirror hiding inside. So, yeah, it's just one of those things. All right, so just cleaning that up a little bit. Um, one of the things that I will do, this mirror is actually quite hazy. So I'm just gonna take this thing apart. Uh, basically, you've got to remove two pins at the back here, which just come out from the side. And then the rest of this will all sort of just come apart in your hands once you've done that. And that's the inside. So I'm just gonna really disassemble this. Give the inside a bit of a dust. I mean, it's not really dusty. Honestly, this is very clean inside. It's really just a little bit of that haze on the front surface. Get a little bit of glass cleaning up. You really don't need to go nuts in terms of cleaning this mirror. It's quite a soft surface. In fact, I believe this part's sort of made of plastic. So very gently does it. You really just want to clean it until the main dirt is off. If you can see yourself in it reflecting nicely, uh, it's done. You do not want to scrub on this too much or you'll put marks on it. Now I tend to find that the SLR680 curved mirror in the viewfinder assembly tends to, like, I don't know if it's just me, but I tend to observe that they're, they're generally a poorer quality than those that were used in the SX-70s. I don't know if Polaroid seemed to change the material, but I never find them to be quite as bright as those in the SX-70. And I really, I cannot tell you why, but there's always just something about the SLR680 when you look through the viewfinder. It always tends to be a little dim. And I've never really figured out why that's the case. And I can only assume that they changed something about one of the mirrored surfaces, whether they changed the Fresnel screen or whether they changed the curved mirror. You'll often just find that they look a little dimmer. Now, obviously, the autofocus kind of makes up for that because you don't need to be as critical focusing. The camera will do most of that for you. Uh, but yeah, it's just something that I noticed. All right. So I'm just going to put this thing back together now. Which is kind of fiddly. Especially when, when this silly tube keeps trying to escape. Here we go.
Easy, easy. Okay. That's there. I'm going to hold that here. Uh, I'm going to... See, like, it's really clean in here. It's just a little hazy, I think just from storage. Now load that spring in place. This is, this is really the hardest part, is getting this little viewfinder window back on. Um, oftentimes, if I do this, I actually do this at the end of the restoration, while the viewfinder is attached to the camera, because it makes juggling this little viewfinder window just that little bit easier. Uh, but I'm doing it off the camera because, well, that's just how it is at the moment, it's in pieces. Um, but if you, if you leave this bottom panel attached to the camera while you're taking the eyepiece off, it prevents those little arms at the back from falling off like that. But we got there in the end. I remember having a chat with another tech who watched me do it while it was attached to the camera and he was like, why do you leave it attached to the camera? And I was like, no, oh, it doesn't fall apart as much. And he's like, oh, okay. Makes sense. And last thing I'll clean is just that little wafer lens. This little piece here uh, is what sits on the little hole that shines into the bellows, uh, that peers into the bellows and provides the image. Cool. Um, I tell you what, this feels a little, um, feels a little stiff. I'm gonna put a bit of plastic grease on some of the rails here. Um, the Japanese made Polaroid 690 greased these rails and it's actually, it's really helpful. Just makes it feel that little bit more smooth to just grease the arms ever so slightly. And then we're gonna wipe off the excess grease. But it works really, really well. Yeah, that feels much better. Much, much better. Cool. All right, I'm just gonna grab a cloth. And get the excess grease off the viewfinder rails. Yeah, much better. All right. Let us continue the reassembly process. And then one thing I am going to do, I will remove just a tiny bit of dust from that camera's lens. Uh, yesterday I was umming and ahhing as to whether or not I should remove the lens. Um, I'm going to show you guys how I do it. All the techs seem to, uh, there's a little spider crawling across my bench. Hey, little buddy. Well, I mean, I am in Australia after all. Doo -doo -doo -doo. This, is, this has truly been, like there's something cursed about this camera because I've had nothing but distractions from wildlife and dogs. There we go, stick that away. Um, mailmen, dogs barking, neighbors doing yard work using leaf blowers. This has been like the cursed, <laughs> the cursed repair, which is funny because the client of mine that sent me this, he just has a habit of sending me repairs that like always go wrong somehow. <laughs> like either he sends me cameras that are just so far gone that I'm like, dude, I can't fix this. This is like a scrap camera for parts, right? Um, or he'll send me a camera like this, where my video is constantly interrupted. Um, but yeah, I, th I think he's just got very bad luck. All right. Now, what I'm gonna do, the focusing wheel, I'm gonna mark where it lines up with the little idler gear here, which will help in terms of me putting it back together. Um, now, one of the ways that you can remove the lens is by removing the light dark wheel, removing the walking arm, removing the focus wheel. You don't need to do all of that if you 
just want to clean behind the front lens cell. If you want to avoid having to take all that other stuff apart, because really it's immaculate condition, like there's no need for me to open up the shutter any further than this. I, I will be doing an SLR 680 in a future video where absolutely it's necessary. But that's all you have to do, right, is stick a, remove that screw, stick a screwdriver in just to separate that top um, metal part of the chassis, and it, it separates that gear from the focusing cell. And then what you can do is pushing down on the idler gear, you can now just remove the front cell. Like so, much easier. Now obviously pay attention, the focusing wheel did move a little bit, but that is fine, that's why I put the pencil marking there. Um, you don't want to get that wrong, by the way, because it can mess up your uh, flash sync, so the cam follower can become unsynchronized, and you can end up with the wrong aperture during flash exposures. It's not something that you really want. Now there is, again, very little dust like in this lens. I'm really just doing this for the sake of thoroughness here. It's all right. Yep, that's basically it. And there's a tiny little speck of dust right here which I'll remove. It's like a little bit of carpet fluff or something. Pretty common to find its way in. All right, let's get my spludger back in there, put the lens cell on, press down on the idler wheel, send this thing home, and on an autofocus camera, it's tempting to leave the, the lens at infinity, you don't, you leave it set slightly past infinity uh, because the camera has a certain level of back focus. Um, effectively, when the autofocus is engaged, it moves the gear one single tooth and that sets it to infinity. So now I'll push down the metal chassis so that everything connects and I'll just make sure, yep, that's all perfect. Now we can put that screw back in. And that is easily, that is simply the easiest way of just taking off that front lens cell. Now, the screws that hold on the light dark wheel here are what they call scrivets. They're kind of like a cross between a screw and a rivet. It's got like a 45 degree thread. So it's like one single twist and the screw pops out. These can become oxidized or the plastic shrinks or they're just poorly cast and the heads can actually snap straight off the screws. So be aware of that. It's no one's fault when that happens. It's just something to be aware of. It happens on the sonar cameras. Alphas sometimes I think have these scrivets, but not all the time. I'm gonna attempt to take one out to just show you guys. Yeah, this one's, so be gentle with them. There, they, they kind of look like a little mini screw, but with a 45 degree thread. These are coming out pretty easily. But sometimes you'll go to turn that screw and it will literally just snap in your hand. Um, I don't even know why I'm opening this. There's no dust here. <laughs> like this camera is practically perfect in terms of its overall condition. But I figured I would just show you guys. Um, if you guys are watching this video like, oh man, what a disappointing overhaul, uh, you know, he didn't really repair much. Well, that's because so far, not a lot appears to be really broken. It's, it's really a preemptive maintenance type of thing, making sure that everything's clean, making sure that mirror isn't about to fall down, making sure everything works. Um, I still don't know if this is gonna power on because the other day, you guys will probably remember when I went to test it, nothing was happening, even using my AAA test pack that I have, which uh, is this one here. 
Um, this basically has AAA batteries in it, and at the moment it's running off four 1.5 volt lithium batteries. So this has more than enough juice to run anything. So I don't know why the camera isn't powering up. It could even possibly have a dead PCB, meaning that I'm gonna really have to rebuild it all over again if this doesn't start up this time. Um, but of course we have uh, cleaned the rear switch. The next thing that I'll have to look at will be the gear train along the side. Um, it'll either need contact cleaning or the switch is removed and replaced, possibly removed and cleaned. We'll really see what happens, but I'm just gonna put the lens board on with two screws just to hold it in place. I mean, really one screw would suffice, but I'll just put on two just to make sure everything's in place. And then I'm gonna resolder that ribbon cable. And I'll put the base panel on, I think, and I'll try and power it using my external battery back. If not, we'll use the test pack. Uh, and if that still fails, I do have some like fresh 600 film that I bought at the store yesterday afternoon after I finished recording. Um, because I know that my test packs of 600 film, my batteries are running a little low in them. And honestly, when it comes to testing a camera, an empty fresh pack is still easily the best way of doing it. So soldering iron is nice and hot. I'm just gonna put a bit of flux on the side here um, and then we'll re-solder the side. Flux, again, is not strictly necessary, but it does help. It just helps make the solder flow better. on. What I'm doing is just tacking them down to start off with and then I will follow it up with a bit of fresh solder. Now that's attached well enough for testing purposes, but I'll just finish the job. There we go. And we're left with little shiny chrome teeth where the solder was added, and now I'm just gonna clean off that flux. With a bit of isopropyl alcohol. All right. Now I guess for the moment of truth, uh, I'm gonna just reassemble a few things starting with the uh, starting with the shutter uh, and just I guess see if this works let's actually put the base of the camera on Put the door on. I'm not going to hold the camera base on with any screws just yet uh, because this reservoir, um, this this battery tester that I made is actually a reservoir Power Ranger, but I basically gutted the internals and just hardwired in a bunch of AAA batteries and some smoothing capacitors. And uh, yeah, I run them off those same Kratax rechargeable 1.5 volt AAAs. Um, I found that system to be a lot more reliable than Reservots, uh, and certainly 
AAA batteries I can keep around the house and, and charged up. All right, now let's put an I-type pack of film in here because we're using external power. Hey, there we go. So it does work. Um, now, I'll remind you guys, yesterday I was testing this with those same Kratax AAAs, uh, except, you know, mounted in my AAA test pack, which I, I burnt in with a soldering iron, the word test, and positive and negative. Um, this definitely outputs 6 volts. I know it works. I've been using it to test other cameras all of yesterday. Did not want to power this, so I would say that this thing had a seized motor. Now, does the autofocus work? It does not. All right, so we need to rebuild the opto sensor. Oh boy. Dear, oh dear. So I think in yesterday's video, I was telling you guys that this is often a problem in SLR 680s, and this camera is no exception. Uh, basically underneath this PCB at the back here, is what they call a rotary encoder, um, and it uses an infrared LED and emitter. And uh, yeah, clearly the infrared LED at the very least has burnt out, and so this does not work. The shutter works fine, but the autofocus is focusing to the same distance every single time. So it's focusing to just beyond a meter, or about four and a half feet, and that is the hyperfocal distance of the SLR 680. Uh, we'll just charge the flash. We'll see if that works as well. Um, I'm manually just triggering the shutter using the, the, the terminals here. So the top one and the side one are for the autofocus, which will only turn on once the flash is charged. And the bottom terminal and the uh, side terminal, if you bridge those, it fires the shutter. So it should fire the flash now. Yep. So everything here is working, um, but I will need to take this apart and do the opto sensor. And I'm going to have to message my client and let him know um, because this is slowly turning into a bigger and bigger repair job. Um, opto sensors are quite difficult to do and they require parts and quite a bit of skill. Um, I, I would say that it's among like the harder jobs that you can do to repair a Polaroid camera. And it is the downside with the autofocus models. But at least the viewfinder looks super clean. The rest of the camera clearly works. Uh, I just have to do something about that flash unit. Uh, sorry, the sonar unit, which does not autofocus. And uh, yeah, being an SLR 680, they are just that little bit extra difficult to take apart. Um, I guess uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll probably leave this video here and end up doing a part two because this video has already gone on for way too long. Um, I may come back and specifically do an opto sensor video. Either that, or I'll edit it and tack it on to the end of this one. But right now I have to cut and see what my client wants to do about this. Until next time. All right, guys, you are in for a treat. I just had a chat with my client and uh, he happens to be the owner of a gold SX-70, uh, the gold SX-70 sonar to be exact, which as I described at the start of this video, is basically the same as the SLR 680 from the body onwards. So what we're gonna do, he said, screw it. If you're gonna take that thing apart to that level, might as well combine the cameras and make a gold SLR 680, which possibly will be like one of a kind. Um, it may be the world's only one. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to repair the opto sensor. Uh, I'll probably do that in another video. This video has already gone on for way too long. And I'm going to refurbish a gold SLR6 uh, a gold SX70 sonar body. And we're going to smoosh all the parts together and make something amazing. I will see you 
in the next video, guys. Um, I hope you liked this one. Honestly, this video ended up turning into a bit of a shambles, I think. Um, so many distractions, so many weird things that uh, went on with this camera. Um, and it's one of those things where, as I said, if the body of the camera isn't working, you can't even test the shutter. And because that motor was seized, uh, I couldn't test the shutter unit itself. The autofocus was dead. It is repairable. Um, I'm very confident that I can get it working again. I'll just have to do it in another video. Um, but yeah, this is going to be one very uh, interesting, um, very interesting ride. So uh, thank you for watching. Um, and uh, I am going to see you guys in the next video. Remember to like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, hopefully you're enjoying the channel. Uh, will all repairs be as chaotic as this one? I certainly don't know. Um, but what I will do actually, I, I am going to film test this with some 600 film now. I really want to see what marks, uh, if, well, what, what results from that small mark on the mirror. Um, because I just don't know if it'll affect the film or not. If it does, we're certainly going to be using the mirror in the gold sonar. Um, anyway, stay tuned guys and uh, have an amazing day.